are here with Donna Riley, who is a distinguished lecturer. Thank you very much for joining us today. My pleasure. Now, you are going to be speaking on Wednesday, and your topic is rigor. Tell us what it's about. So rigor is a concept that's been used really against a lot of engineering education researchers to devalue our work. And it's even used within engineering. So for example, um, an engineer that uses less complex math in their work is seen as being less rigorous than someone who uses more complex math. And my question is, why do we use that as the measure of the value of our work? Because if we said, if we looked at, say, social value, what's the impact of an engineer's work on saving lives, for example, we might come up with a really different prioritization of, of work in engineering. And then in engineering education, what I think's happened is that because of that devaluing, we've said, oh, we're going to talk about rigorous engineering education research, but I wonder about who's being excluded when we say that. Because oftentimes the people that are doing the research that has, say, higher social value and your sort of arbiter of, of the value is not how much math you have in it, it's are you making a difference? The people that are doing those kinds of work are often people of color, women, and you know, also white men, but people from working class backgrounds, disabled people often care about a different set of hierarchical problems than just what has the most interesting math in it. So I wonder who we're excluding when we say that rigor needs to be the measure. And it's not clear yet how that is going to um, affect engineering education research, but I want to ask that question so we can have that conversation as a community. So that really ties in with another topic of the old sink or swim motto. Explain how those two go together. Exactly. So, so rigor itself as a concept is often about physical exertion. You talk about the rigors of cold, the rigors of exercise, and one of the things that happens in sink or swim engineering education is you say, oh, can you stay up all night to finish that problem set? And when you have a diverse student population, there's a number of students who can't do that. Maybe they're a low-income student who has to work a second job on top of their work study and, and they just can't stay up all night. Maybe there's a student who has a disability that prevents them from, from being able to tax their body in that way. Or maybe you have students who are adults with families and they have other obligations where, where they need to be home tending to their children. And so when we have an environment that requires that of students, we're losing a lot of talent. So let's get into your many hats. You are not only the associate professor at Smith College, you're currently the program officer at the National Science Foundation in the Division of Engineering Education. Talk to us about what you're working on in Washington, D.C. right now. So I just started there in March, and so I'm still learning how everything works there, and it's been really exciting and really interesting. It's, um, what's really great about it is having been part of the engineering education research community for some time now, to be able to go and really get a big picture view of what everybody is doing and to be part of, of a group of people who's interested in really investing in the community and helping us get to what the next, what the next thing is in research. And we've been thinking a lot about how you make uh, change happen in educational institutions. And I think that that's a cutting edge where we've had a lot of efforts about change in over the past several decades and we've learned a lot from those and we're now getting ready for sort of, okay, what's the next thing that we can do that's, that's really going to push us forward in that area. And getting back to Smith College, you have a really innovative track record there. You're a founding faculty member of the Engineering College, the first women's college to have an engineering program. So with the need for more female engineers, do you see perhaps a different dynamic in all women's engineering programs versus the typical old model? Well, the first thing that I noticed, I had taught before at Princeton and at Carnegie Mellon, and the thing that you notice is that in co-ed environments, women tend to um, to either hold back from leadership roles or there just aren't enough women to sort of be in leadership roles. And you see this happen in, in lab environments. You often see women not having access to the hands-on equipment and you have to intervene in order to make sure everybody has access. Or you see um, more men taking on the sort of like um, sort of traditionally masculine design projects and you see more men in mechanical and electrical engineering in those settings and women tend to be in bioengineering, environmental engineering. But at Smith, what's really interesting is that no matter what it is, you see women in those roles. And, and women at Smith most frequently major in mechanical and electrical engineering, which is what you would see on a national level. And so I think it's really interesting that when the gender dynamic changes, you see women participating more fully in all aspects of engineering. All right, Donna Riley, thank you very much. Best of luck to you on Wednesday. Distinguished lecturer on rigor. Thank, thank you. you.